tonight on Unsolved Mysteries. Most people would go to great lengths to avoid the fiery pain of a bee sting. Most, but not all. Meet two women with multiple sclerosis who are convinced that the venom of honeybees has been their salvation. After 10 years of scandal and controversy, the notorious preppy rape case ended in a hung jury. Now Alex Kelly, a son of wealth and privilege, awaits the start of his retrial. In a special demonstration, we'll examine a key piece of evidence that apparently helped decide the outcome. For Jamie Santos, the benefits of exotic dancing always outweighed the risks. Then Jamie was found murdered in her apartment. Incredibly, police believe the killer himself may have reported the crime. In Nevada, a forest ranger and his family are targeted. Its simmering hostilities over federal land use erupt into violence. Also, they were separated as young children on the other side of the Atlantic. Nearly 50 years later, they've been reunited here in the United States. Join me. Perhaps you hold the key. Perhaps you may be able to help solve a mystery. There's no mistaking the sound, the quiet thunder of bees. Unless you're in the honey business, you undoubtedly avoid any person-to-person -person contact with bees. However, to some people, honey bees are miniature flying drugstores, dispensaries of miracle cures. You're about to meet two women who say they've experienced the miracle. Both have multiple sclerosis, or MS a crippling disease of the nervous system whose complications can be fatal. Both have reversed the course of MS through a controversial treatment known as bee venom therapy, literally stinging themselves with honeybees. Kelly Ames was in high school when MS first crept into her life. By the time Kelly was 22, her symptoms became impossible to ignore. One day I was in work and I was walking down a flight of stairs. There must have been like 12 stairs where I just lost the feeling in my feet like all of a sudden and I fell down a flight of stairs and the women in my office were like, wow, you know, I, I explained to them that my feet sometimes get numb. Medical tests revealed the cruel truth. Kelly had MS. The unforgiving disease first robbed her of the ability to walk alone. Before long, MS was attacking her eyes. This is so weird, Donald. I can't see anything out of this eye. I'm... It's all right. I get you. I get you. It's like it took over my life. Within that week, I lost the vision in my left eye, and I had no control over my muscles. It was just very devastating. I hated to depend on other people, but at times I needed other people to help me. Kelly's doctor put her on steroids. These potent drugs can temporarily relieve the symptoms of MS, but no drug can stop its advance. Having the steroid dripped into my arm, I would sit there for an hour and a half looking at other MS people coming in in wheelchairs and wondering if that's gonna be me someday, you know, in that wheelchair. Then Kelly met a woman who had literally walked away from her wheelchair after systematically stinging herself with honeybees. For Kelly Ames, it was a last ray of hope. Kelly's father brought her to a local beekeeper who'd been helping MS patients for years. He was happy to donate the honeybees. The rest would be up to Kelly. Kelly, these are the honeybees that are gonna He told me that he didn't want to be bothered by me if I wasn't serious about it. He says, you have to do this for six months straight every other day faithfully. Increase it by two every other day until you get to 20. And 
he scared me when he said that because I realized that I really had to take the responsibility of sticking to this. And I did. You all set, honey? Mm -hmm. Kelly and her boyfriend set up a morning routine. He placed the bees at specific spots on Kelly's body, spots where nerves running to the damaged areas were most accessible. For Kelly's failing eyesight, that was behind the ear. You all right? Mm -hmm. Bees were also positioned on Kelly's lower back to treat the weakness in her legs. The bees were left in place for as long as 15 minutes to allow all their venom to penetrate Kelly's skin. I'm just getting dressed and I'll come back, OK? OK. I'll pull those up. MS had so ravished Kelly's nervous system that she stung herself several hundred times before actually feeling the full wallop of a sting. I could actually feel what a bee sting felt like, and it hurt. It really hurt. I was screaming. I had my head in my pillow, and I was screaming. And I was screaming because I was happy because I could feel again. I knew that this therapy was starting to work because within a week, my eyesight started to slowly come back. I didn't depend on my cane as much. And right then and there, I just knew, finally, this was kicking in, and it was working for me. I know Kelly Ames, and her situation is a perfect example of how bee venom therapy helps MS. She was not doing well. And when she started her bee venom therapy, it had a clear difference in her symptoms and her outlook on life. Do you think you're numb enough in that area? Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, what I'm gonna do is grab the bee by the upper part of the body. Today, Kelly Ames teaches bee venom therapy to others in the grip of multiple sclerosis. While some doctors dismiss the therapy as little better than voodoo, Kelly's remarkable recovery is hardly unique. When I decided to do bee venom therapy, um, we kind of kept it a little hush-hush because I didn't know what other people's reactions would be. Um, I knew what the reactions from my doctors were, so I figured, you know, well, we'll keep it a little quiet. Maureen Norton began to experience the symptoms of MS shortly after the birth of her second child. She was seized by a tingling pins and needles sensation in her legs that made walking nearly impossible. Mommy, will you play with me? Oh, that was very scary. I just kind of pictured my, myself in a wheelchair holding my little baby and my son along the side. And uh, I, didn't, I didn't want that. But that was right where Maureen was headed. Then she started bee venom therapy. I was always afraid of bees and about uh, being stung, but I just felt that this was my only answer. A beekeeper who lived nearby agreed to teach Maureen the fine art of bee wrangling, how to grab its bristly neck and coerce it to jab its stinger at precisely the right location. I was told to sting it right on the top of your foot right here, OK? By the time Maureen got started with bee stings, MS had numbed her feet so thoroughly she could hardly sense they were there. To the touch, Maureen's feet were icy blue cold. OK, I think that's long enough. Within okay, minutes, my foot was warm. You could feel the venom going through, and the blood felt like, you know, there was life in my foot again. It was just an incredible feeling. I knew right from that moment that something good was happening, and I, I felt that this was going to help me. How much did it help? This photograph of Maureen and her son was taken six weeks after she began the sting therapy. Maureen has just crossed the finish line in a seven-mile MS walkathon. Three weeks later, Maureen was prancing across the dance floor at a party celebrating her spectacular recovery. Today, I'm a very active person. I haven't had any attacks. Sometimes, um, depending if the stress gets um, too much in my life, that, you know, I'll get some pins and needles feelings in my hands or in my right knee. I immediately just take my bees out, and I'll give myself a couple of stings, and the feeling's gone. Should we prize bees for their sting as well as their honey? 
mainstream science has hardly begun to address the question, though some doctors believe bee venom therapy is far too promising to be ignored. At first, it may be easy to dismiss bee venom therapy. Uh, the fact is, it sounds a little kooky. However, in studying about bee venom, there are certain substances which make sense in multiple sclerosis therapy. We know that the immune system is involved, and of course, the neurologic system is involved. Therefore, bee venom, which has components which affect both the immune system and neurologic system, is a natural substance which seems to have some effects in MS. Skeptics might argue that improvements reported by bee advocates are in reality the periodic remissions typical of MS. But Kelly Ames is convinced her progress is a direct result of bee venom therapy. I stopped doing the therapy for a couple of weeks and I felt myself sliding back. I felt some symptoms coming on again and it scared me. So right away, I grabbed a bee, I stung myself a couple of times, and within seconds I could feel it go throughout my body and stimulate my muscles and make me much stronger. So right then and there, I know I'm not in remission. It's time for physicians and the medical community to take a serious look at whether bee venom may relieve the suffering of some of our patients. Estimates are that as many as 10,000 MS patients are currently using bee venom therapy. Proponents also claim success in treating arthritis and chronic fatigue syndrome. Recently, the Multiple Sclerosis Association of America began funding major scientific research on this controversial treatment. Bee experts do have one warning. Roughly one person in 25 is deathly allergic to honey bee stings. Anyone considering this treatment should consult a physician. Coming up, last November, the rape trial of Alex Kelly ended in a hung jury. Now we put a critical defense claim to the test. Also, when a popular exotic dancer is murdered, the only clue is an anonymous call to 911. But first, a U.S. forest ranger searches for the unknown bomber who attacked his family. March 31st, 1995, Carson City, Nevada. Guy, the bomb was placed right over here on the window ledge. And as you can see... U.S. Forest Service Ranger Guy Pence was called to work just after dawn. An explosion had ripped through his office the night before. Do you have any idea what kind of bomb this was? The FBI initially believed the bomber had targeted the building, not any particular employees. Guy Pence suspected otherwise. I really always felt that it was aimed um, as a direct statement to me. Now, it may be aimed as a direct statement to me as a district ranger or as a federal employee, and not so much uh, at me specifically. Why would Guy Pence or the Forest Service be a target? Perhaps because they are on the front line of a war most of us don't even know about. Some call it the Sagebrush Rebellion an informal alliance of people opposed to federal control of local public lands. For most of this century, ranchers, loggers, and miners have had permits that gave them access to huge tracts of that land. In some families, those permits have been handed down through five generations. Over a long history, we've always had conflicts over natural resource management. And that can be conflicts over uh, grazing, timber harvest, recreation. To accommodate all users and protect the diminishing resources, the U.S. Forest Service began to restrict private use. As district ranger, it was up to Guy Pence to make sure everyone complied with the new rules. Everybody on the district across the board is going to make a 20% cut. Well, I reckon we've been through worse. We'll handle this one, too. I'm with you. I'm glad to hear it. Most people didn't like it, but they went along. However, some saw Guy Pence himself as the enemy. You wind up with 22 extra tomorrow, you just bring him back up on your own, and we'll just call it good. No, I don't think so. that's the case. We're running the whole herd through. Michael, we went through this. We said 800, and you said you weren't going to give me any trouble about it. I don't think that's the case, Guy. 
not making a mistake, Michael. Guy Pitts says scenes like this have become a regular part of his job. Similar conflicts all over the West to what originally gave rise to the Sagebrush Rebellion. Make a the issue that we have here is these people have a right to graze forage, they have a right to mine the minerals, they have a right to harvest term timber, and the bureaucrats have exceeded their authority in some way or trying to stop them one way or the other, and we are standing up as county governments to protect their rights. Well, I'm telling you what's going to happen. Ironically, many of the people opposed to the new federal rules are local elected leaders like Commissioner Carver. However, they too say they are dismayed by violent acts like the bombing of Pence's office. We were devastated by it. The first thing we did is notified our county sheriff's department to put extra patrol on, on all the federal agency employees in Nye County. Uh, we uh, posted a $100,000 bond. We want to put a stop to it as bad as anybody else. Four months after the bombing, any question about whether Guy Pence had been personally targeted was erased. Pence took a backcountry assignment. He brought along his youngest daughter. Guy's wife, Linda, stayed at home with her two older daughters. It was August 4th, 1995. We had been making pickles, which is a very hot job, and lots of boiling water going on in the kitchen to add to the heat of the whole house, and we were about finished and had rented a movie, and Morgan and I had gone into the front room to get that started, and we sat down next to the windows. Yeah, last year, remember? Coulter, our oldest daughter, was back in her bedroom at the back side of the house talking on the phone with a friend. Coulter, it's starting! I thought you wanted to see this! What was that? What? You didn't hear that? What'd you hear? I think I heard someone walking or, or footsteps or something out there. Okay, sweetie, I'll go check on. Okay. There's the buzzer for the pickles. Can you grab them? Oh, yeah. When Linda looked outside, she saw nothing unusual. Mom? Mom, can you help me with this? Yeah. Thanks. I went into the kitchen, and Morgan so this is going to take a few minutes. I better go turn off the movie. Fortunately, no one was hurt. The homemade bomb had been placed directly beneath Guy Pence's van. The charred wreckage was an unmistakable message. It's a very hard thought to accept that someone would try to kill your family. There's absolutely no doubt in my mind that whoever did this knew my family was at home. The windows were open. The lights were on, the TV was on. My own daughter heard their footsteps and that they left a killing device and ran into the darkness. I have a hard time comprehending how any human could do that. Like the first bombing, there were a few solid clues and no suspects. The FBI laboratory in Washington, D.C has advised us that these bombs are very similar in construction and most likely were manufactured by the same individual. We're not looking for a sophisticated bomber in this particular case. We're looking for someone who knows the, the basics and the basic use and uh, application of explosives to make this bomb, but this was not a mastermind by any stretch of the imagination. While the FBI continues searching for the person or persons responsible for both attacks, Guy Pence and his family have moved to another location. He could have quit his job, but Guy chose to keep working for the Forest Service. I think the stakes are very high. Those stakes are our natural resources. 
those stakes belong to all of us, 300 million Americans, and those unborn today, those, are, those resources belong to them. It's extremely important to me that, that the forces that support this kind of thing understand that this is not ever how you win, that you only lose. That's extremely important, that this perpetrator be brought to justice so that everyone understands this is not how we solve our problems. Next, a woman is reunited with her long-lost brother, thanks to you, our viewers. And later, a simple car seat mechanism plays a crucial role in the notorious preppy rape trial. Most of us have gladly spent a lifetime trying to find someone we love. Tonight's update took that and more. It involves a search to span two continents, two generations, and almost half a century. Oh, I don't want you to get sick. Plymouth, England, 1952. Helena Karowski helped her five-year-old son prepare for a long journey. Christopher was going to the United States with another family. I'll miss you, Mama. I'll miss you too, Christopher. My mother didn't really want to send him with somebody else. But my father kept saying, you know, education, education. He's going to get a good education. He's going to be able to start school. So it was easier for him. But my mother, I guess being a woman, it just tore at her heart. It was only seven years after World War II. Refugees from Eastern Europe, like Helena and her husband Apollinari, desperately wanted a better life. In America, Christopher would live with friends until the Karowskis and their daughter Michelle could follow. Oh, Christopher, you take care. We'll see you very soon. We'll see you very soon. A few months later, however, the Karowskis changed their plans and decided to stay in England. They wrote their friends in America, asking them to send Christopher back. I've received letter from America. America. Yes, they are not, they don't send Christopher back. What? They don't send Christopher back. Christopher. The Karowskis tried every avenue they could think of to have Christopher returned, but there was nothing anyone could do. The Karowskis never saw Christopher again. In 1973, Apollinary died. 20 years later, Helena also passed away. Her last wish was that her children would someday be reunited. I want to be able to tell him how much my mother loved him, how she never forgot him, how to the day she died, that she loved him. After so many years, we knew finding Michelle's brother might be a long shot. In fact, the story aired several times with little response. But not long ago, the right person was watching. Keely Shea Smith is on maternity leave. Is Lou Hanessian with the details. Thanks, Bob. As it turned out, the critical viewer was Christopher's adoptive sister. When she told him about Michelle's search, Christopher called our phone center. He gave the operator specific details only Michelle's long-lost brother could have known. A month later, Christopher traveled from his home in upstate New York to Michelle's home outside Houston, Texas. It was a moment 44 years in the making. As I was waiting for Christopher to come and I was looking out the window, I was wanting my mum to be here and wishing that she was here because she had dreamed of this. Hi. Hi. It's been a long time. You did it. Oh, I can't believe it. I really can't describe how, how I felt. It's, I can't describe it. It's, it's too much for words. All these years, wondering, hoping, and it's finally come true. Christopher introduced his wife, Ellen, then met Michelle's husband, Derek, 
her daughter Carrie, and her granddaughters Kaylee and Danielle. My granddaughter Kaylee right here. <laughs> I'm just happy, I'm happy that I have him now. <laughs> it's just so hard to describe. Um, something I've, I've dreamt about, God, for, you know, 30 odd years. And it's here, it's, yeah, you know, still, I keep looking at him because I, I can't believe it's actually happened. <laughs> Christopher and Michelle have a lot of catching up to do, but they're already well on their way. I never expected it to really happen, but I always dreamed that maybe one day my turn will come and I would find my brother. But dreams, I guess they do come true. Coming up, a beautiful young dancer is murdered and some believe the killer himself notified the police. But first, the trial of accused rapist Alex Kelly ended in a hung jury. Will independent testing validate the defense or the prosecution? It was a trial 10 years in the making. The case has scandalized and captivated the national media. Last October, alleged rapist Alex Kelly, after nearly a decade on the run, faced his accuser in court. She is now a grown woman. She claims that in February of 1986, just after her 16th birthday, Alex Kelly raped her. The trial ended with a jury hopelessly deadlocked. Tonight, with a retrial on the horizon, we will take a unique look at one of the pivotal issues in this case, which may ultimately determine whether Alex Kelly could, in fact, be guilty as charged. Darien, Connecticut, 40 miles northeast of New York City, is one of the country's most affluent and exclusive communities. Alex Kelly was one of Darien's brightest young men, with a wealthy, devoted family and a promising future. In high school, Kelly was a gifted wrestler with a trademark move, the guillotine. Alex Kelly was 18 years old when his perfect world came crashing down. On February 10th, 1986, he met the alleged victim during a party at this house. At around 11.30 p.m., Kelly offered to take her home in his girlfriend's Jeep Wagoneer. But according to the young woman, Alex Kelly did not drive her home. Instead, she claimed he pulled into this secluded cul-de-sac and proceeded to rape her. Four days later, this time at the nearby Stamford Country Club, another party, another young woman, another accusation against Alex Kelly. Kelly was arrested for both alleged rapes. He denied the charges, claiming that both incidents have been acts of consensual sex he was released on $200,000 bond, pending the start of his trial. But when jury selection commenced, Alex Kelly was nowhere to be found. Over the next eight years, he continually eluded the authorities. Then in July of 1994, police and FBI agents raided the Kelly home in Connecticut and learned the surprising truth about Alex Kelly's years on the run. Alex Kelly was leading the good life overseas. He traveled all over. His passport was stamped with, you know, just dozens of countries in and out of Greece and Sweden and France and all over the globe. He spent a lot of his time at ski resorts, living the high life. And, you know, he would write letters home talking about his hang gliding and his parasailing. And, and it won, in one letter, he even said, I could live like this forever. And he wasn't exactly suffering. Photographs in the Kelly home showed Alex's parents visiting him while he was in hiding. Investigators also found an unmailed letter which revealed Kelly's address in Sweden. So Alex knows that law enforcement's closing in on him now. Tom Puccio is hired by the family as Alex's lawyer. Puccio met with Alex in Europe to negotiate the terms of his surrender. And it was shortly thereafter in January of 1995 that he surrendered to Swiss authorities. 
In May of 1995, Kelly was extradited to the U.S. He was arraigned on charges of sexual assault and kidnapping. He was released on $1 million bond. The trial for the first alleged rape commenced in October 1996. Most days, Alex Kelly arrived at court, hand in hand with his old high school girlfriend, Amy Molitor. The star witness was Kelly's alleged victim. In riveting detail, she outlined the terror she said she had experienced. At one point, she said that his hand was on her neck the entire time before he pushed her into the back seat of the, of the Jeep. And at, the mo at that time, it just seemed like that this was her description of what happened, and it didn't seem like this was any more uh, piece of evidence than anything else, and that this wasn't going to mean anything more than anything else she was saying. But it turned out quite differently. Defense attorney Thomas Puccio leapt to the attack. If Alex Kelly's hand had never left the victim's throat, it would have been impossible for him to both release and lower the back seat with his one free hand. First order of business is to thank the, Rick, the jury. In this the case, case ended in a mistrial after the six-person jury deadlocked at four to convict and two to acquit. Later, some of the jurors stated that the testimony about the seat latch had played a major role in the deliberations apparently leading some to believe a rape had never occurred. The victim stated that he reached over and grabbed her by the throat. He immediately put spread his legs over her body, was choking her. Connie Williams was one of the six jurors. Although he ultimately voted to convict, he has lingering doubts as to how the crime might have been committed. Left hand on her throat. He reached around. And at some point, she heard a clicking noise. The clicking noise was the lever being pulled. The lever is a spring-loaded device designed to be lifted and held up while a seat is pushed down. As you can see, there's no way that I can pull this lever forward unless putting my hand forward and pulling the levers forward with both hands in the seat. There was no way I can do it with one hand. Unsolved Mysteries decided to put the defense claim to the test. We asked Failure Analysis Associates, an engineering consulting firm, to conduct an impartial demonstration. It's the case that you'll start with. The firm procured a 1983 Jeep Wagoneer and hired two actors with physical characteristics similar to Alex Kelly and the young woman. Is that right? That that's always like that. Regarding the use of the seat latch, the actor portraying Kelly was simply told where the latch was and that it needed to be lifted to release the seat. He was then told to simulate an attack and simultaneously lower the back seat using only one hand. The test was repeated three times. In each instance, the actor successfully lowered the seat without difficulty. Quite uh, surprising to me that he could physically move the latch so quickly and move the seat back so fast, given the uh, impression I had about the latch mechanism when I first observed the car. What we're seeing in this car is, because of the condition of this particular vehicle, that it is possible to lift this latch and get it stuck on a exposed nut and bolt. The test did, however, contain a built-in flaw. In 1986, the Wagoneer was just three years old. The vehicle in the test was 13 years old. The scientists believe a decade of wear may have weakened the latch so that it could be moved laterally. Okay. To approximate the amount of wear on the latch at the time of the alleged incident, failure analysis next brought in a 1990 Wagoneer, one of the last years the model was manufactured. The test was repeated with a simulated attack. On four occasions, the actor attempted to manipulate the latch and lower the seat with one hand. Only once, on his second attempt, and with a fair amount of difficulty, was he successful. A simple conclusion that it's possible or not possible doesn't seem to be uh, in the works. But nevertheless, we could probably say that with a, with a vehicle that's in relatively new condition, it's very hard to do with one hand. 
Although our uh, our actor was managed to do it that one time, so even there, it's uh, it's that really surprised me. I think that he could do that. Whether that seat could have been operated in the way uh, the alleged victim described is really dependent on the condition of the seat and the age of the vehicle, and that's a primary factor in figuring out whether it could have happened. And that's something we'll never know about the subject vehicle, is the condition of the seat in that vehicle. It should be noted that the subject vehicle was not available for either the court case or our demonstration. It was reported stolen approximately three years after Alex Kelly was arrested. When we returned, she was a beautiful and popular exotic dancer. Now the investigation into her murder hinges on a single question. Who called the police? A good Samaritan or the killer himself? You are about to hear an actual 911 call. It was recorded by an emergency operator in Wheeling, Illinois, just north of Chicago. The caller spoke from a payphone and refused to give his name. Police believe that he alone holds the key to solving a murder. It's code four, fires 97 on scene. The anonymous caller was right. 27-year-old Jamie Santos wasn't breathing. She had been smothered with a pillow, and nothing would ever revive her. Jamie had lived just down the road from her family. Calls and visits were frequent. Holidays were spent together. She was just like a burst of energy when she walked in. You knew she was there, her presence just would just radiate. I think ultimately she just wanted to get married and have a family. Um, success was important to her. I don't think she really had a handle on what she wanted to be successful at. But ultimately, it was children and family. Jamie's aspirations may have been unremarkably tame, but you would never have guessed it if you met her on the job. Jamie had parlayed her natural good looks into a steady income. She pulled in better than $1,000 a week, dancing for exclusive private parties in and around Chicago. When Jamie first told us that she was going into uh, dancing entertainment, uh, it was a little difficult to handle, but when she explained to us how, how it was going to, to work. We felt a little bit more comfortable, because our main concern really wasn't the the type of work she was doing, but it was for her safety. I got it. It's OK. Thanks. Once she reassured us that she'd have uh, somebody accompanying her at all times, the driver or bodyguard, we felt a little bit more comfortable. I'd just like to make a little extra money. I don't think so. No, it's good. It's OK. If uh, she went into a place and the atmosphere wasn't right, either because the the people who had been drinking too much or something, they'd just float up and leave. Are you going to On Sunday, October 27th, 1991, Jamie didn't feel no. well. She canceled her bookings. She rented a couple of videotapes. She called a friend. That is what we know about the last night Jamie Santos was alive. Oh, I did really good this weekend. The call for help came the next morning, roughly 11.30 a.m. No, no, no. There's no time. Send an ambulance to 1765 Stonehenge Court in Wheeling immediately. There's a young woman. She's not breathing. She's turning blue. Paramedics found Jamie in her bedroom. There were obvious signs of a struggle, yet Jamie's head was carefully propped on a pillow. She had not been raped. 
With no eyewitnesses, no fingerprints, and nothing that would yield a DNA profile, the only lead was a male voice on the 911 tape. No one in Jamie's family could identify the caller. Investigators could not even determine whether he was the killer or simply a passerby. There's a possibility the 911 caller could be an innocent bystander that stumbled upon this. There's evidence of a struggle. Possibly somebody could have heard a struggle. Possibly somebody could have seen somebody running from the area and uh, seen an open door. Anybody home? Hello? 911 caller could be afraid to come forward, thinking that they'll be accused of being the killer when, in fact, you know, they were bystander. However, in this perplexing case, police can just as easily envision a scenario where the 911 call was made by the killer himself. Hey. Hi. Hey, can uh, I come and talk for a while? Well, we've already talked. I. We don't have evidence that there was forced entry, so there's a good chance the person was an invited guest. No, don't. Don't. Could be a crime of passion. It could have been something that started out innocently and turned bad. It could have been uh, a domestic type argument. Look, I'm gonna have to ask you to leave. What? This is no. Oh, don't start with this. No, no, don't. no, 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 no. Don't! You're hurting me! Stop no. it! Of uh, course! Cool. <laughs> Things went too far, and when the person realized that he had hurt Jamie, um, he had remorse, and in that, he tried to, in several ways, get her help. You know, he put a pillow under her head, he, he made an honest effort to get a medical help for her. Further bolstering the theory that the killer knew Jamie was his certainty when providing Jamie's address to the operator. 911. Uh, send somebody, ambulance or police, to 1765 Stonehenge Court in Wheeling immediately. 1765 Stonehenge? Stonehenge, well, I like the bush. What phone are you calling His from? familiarity with the area means that he had been there either several times before or he had a specific reason to have the knowledge he did of the address as far as the numbers and the street and the pronunciation of the street. Authorities believe that if the killer did know Jamie Santos, there is a strong likelihood he had set his sights on her within the world of exotic dancing. Hey, 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 You're really sexy. Perhaps one of Jamie's clients couldn't take no for an answer. Perhaps one of her drivers had been nursing a secret passion that flared out of control. But every question leads to the same brick wall. The 911 tape is a very important clue. We feel that with the identification of the voice on this tape, we can resolve this matter. I'm always trying to figure out if I know the voice, if I know who that person is. Um, I, I mean, I hear the urgency in his voice, and it just brings up all the emotions of I know what he's seen, and I know that I can't help her. I feel that this person could give us some information on this, and I can't understand why he doesn't come forward and help us to relieve some of the pain of Jamie's death. Here again is the actual 911 recording made in October of 1991. If you recognize the voice, contact the Wheeling, Illinois Police Department. Please listen closely. Join me again next time for another intriguing edition of Unsolved Mysteries.